Hey everyone, this is Olga on People of Substance by Lemon Skies. I am thrilled to have my guest today, Nathan Chappell, just like Dave Chappell. I had to clarify that before we hopped on here. Um, and you know, Nathan, you have a lot of interesting backgrounds. So you're SVP at Donor Search. Uh, you're an author of Generosity Crisis, uh, a book that um, seemed to be very um, prophetic in its way. So we'll talk about that. Um, you are a thought leader on Forbes Technology Council. Um, so you do a lot of things. So please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Olga, for being here. I mean, I, people of substance, I don't know about that. But I I guess, you know, to your, to your point, I always kind of thought of myself or maybe I was pinned as like a renaissance person, which for most of my career, I thought that was a bad thing in the sense that like I didn't have discipline and focus. But I have, you know, I think throughout my career, kind of been a jack of all trades. I mean, I, I'm really probably at heart a technologist. Mm -hmm. I started two tech companies early on when I was just graduating from undergrad, um, sold those, got into nonprofit on accident, spent 20 years raising, you know, more than a billion dollars with the teams I led and learned lots of lots of things the hard way. Um, yeah. And, you know, my last five years have been all around artificial intelligence within the nonprofit sector. So mm -hmm. I guess it is that that like culmination of those two things, like this love for technology, the love of humanity, bringing them together. And then, you know, my left brain side, I guess it is my left brain. I don't know my right brain. I don't even know the difference. It's um, really my more artistic side. So I'm like I'm an avid woodworker, mm -hmm. wood turner. So like when I need therapy and to get away from like zeros and ones, you know, I tend to put on that other hat. So I think what it comes down to is like, I like learning and I've always liked learning. And so whatever gives me that fuel to like try new things is kind of where I go. Um, so we will have to come back to woodworking. I did not know that about you. Um, but can we go back a little bit to where you ended up in nonprofit sector? So you started out in technology and then what prompted you to uh, to work in nonprofit, or I call it nonprofit adjacent space. Yeah, yeah, it's probably not a surprising story because I've, you know, very few people like, you know, grow up as little kids saying, I want to work in a nonprofit. Um, but it's usually kind of like this divine intervention thing where like something happens in the universe kind of guides you down that path. And it turns out I did my first fundraiser when I was eight years old and I ended up in our local newspaper. Uh, a friend of ours had, um, it was actually a friend of mine, a family friend. Um, their daughter had almost drowned in a swimming pool and ended up with traumatic brain injury. And so I didn't know, but I, you know, I'm sure my mom guided me to this idea of like, let's do a fundraiser at the local pizza place. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so that part was always there. Um, I found myself when I was, uh, when I started my second company, I felt this need to give back. And I was probably, yeah, I was eight, um, 20, like I think I was like 19 or 20, I ended up being on uh, serving on a board of directors at a local boys and girls club. Mm -hmm. I had gone to a boys and girls club when I was a kid. So it was very familiar. It's kind of like you do the things that align with your values and your passion. And so the, the, the un, unfamiliar part of this is that I was like three, three months in as a board member, third board meeting. And the director came in one day and said, Hey, I quit. I'm moving to like an Idaho, you know, from California. And, um, I actually was just selling my second business, going to grad school. And at the time, basically the, the, the rest of the board kind of like, it was like Mikey likes it kind of thing. Like Nathan will do it. And I was this, you know, young, optimistic, you know, whatever, gullible person. And so I stepped in, I started serving as the executive director and I thought it would be like a few months until they hired someone that how naive I was. And I ended up there seven years and, you know, yeah, I, I really probably after about two months, I fell in love with the work. I didn't, I never thought about being in a nonprofit for a career. I thought it was something that you volunteered to do because that's what I knew. And uh, it was probably my fifth or sixth week on the job where I came in. I was just kind of, you know, minding the shop, if you will, because I didn't know what I was doing. And there was a kid who was sleeping on the porch. So I, you know, I show up at rolling at like 8 a.m. and there's this kid sleeping on the porch. And it turned out that um, it was this high school kid. He was brilliant. I mean, he was taking trigonometry and Japanese in high school, but his mom was a drug addict and had come home and, um, and he was also type one diabetic. So there's just like all these like crazy things. He had nowhere to go. And the one place that he could go that was safe from the craziness of his family life was Boys and Girls Club to the point where he was sleeping on the porch. 
And so I, I think it was that moment that was like, okay, this is more than a job. This is a way of life. And it's been 20 years, never looking back. I mean, it just like, I fortunately raising money for causes that I just really, really passionate about. And, you know, I think during that whole time, never felt like I went to work one day. Yeah. Find yourself something that doesn't feel like a job. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. I was, I'm so lucky to have had that career and, you know, it was just a way of life and, you know, not a, not a thing I did. Yeah. It was just part of who you are. I'm getting goosebumps just listening about it, uh, seeing somebody and, you know, just seeing your mission and the impact it has on one human, uh, just listening to you describe it is definitely, it's so emotional. I, I, that's one of the things that I think nonprofits have an inherent benefit that for-profit people don't have. And I've had a lot of friends who went also through their MBA program and they worked in pharmaceutical sales or Dun & Bradstreet or whoever. And I felt, I, I, I sense like a certain point in their career where they're longing for that meaning and that purpose. And you know, when you work in a nonprofit, you know, if it's if it's a nonprofit in a cause that you care about at a visceral level, like it's mm -hmm. you know, fuels your soul, then, you know, you just you don't have to look far to get that that boost of energy, mm -hmm. you know, like the hardest day of work is still benefiting humankind or someone else. And so I I mean, that's the that's like the hidden secret sauce of like every nonprofit is like, you know, and unfortunately a lot of them don't tap into that as much. Like when you work, I worked at a big cancer hospital and it's easy to forget that you're literally saving lives. So you have to stop your work and stop your emails and go walk through the cancer hospital and then look around. And then about three seconds later, you find yourself inherently, you know, filled with gratitude for the work that you're doing to help others, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's just like this is an amazing thing. I, I think the people in the outside world who don't really understand the work of philanthropy don't really have that sense of like how incredibly energetic it can be and inspiring the work can be. So this might be a good segue. Um, I have many questions about the book that you recently wrote, um, and it, it really sort of predicted some of the themes that we are uncovering um, that have been bubbling up below the surface and now, you know, uh, generosity crisis. So we'll come back to that in just a minute. But I guess the question I want to ask you first and foremost, before we get into why giving is down, how much of it is a product of how we do the fundraising versus um, decline in philanthropic mindset? And how do we make uh, giving and generosity relevant in our society again? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a really important question. I think the most important question, right? What is where has where is society and how does society view charitable giving and philanthropy mm -hmm. now versus what types of behaviors has the nonprofit sector kind of taken on that have you know either reinforced that mindset and so I guess my you know my perspective on it I you know having raised money for twenty years before there was a lot of technology so I started out before GuideStar like mm -hmm. you know so like literally at that point when I started, you know, fundraising was entirely based on this uh, trust. It was trust as me as a, a leader in our community that was going to do what they said they were going to do with the money. Like, I mean, we could, we could develop reports and, you know, provide impact reports and show the number of kids that we were serving and things like that. But there was still like this tremendous element of trust. It was really more fundraising was really more about, you know, quality versus quantity, to be honest, because I could only have lunch with one person every day. I would, you know, have to, you know, really do go the distance with like building these like truly authentic trust or oriented relationships. And so I think so the one side of the coin that you're talking about is that, you know, in the advent of not just CRMs, but everything, you know, the, the speed at which data has been available and that we could, you know, push more solicitations out faster. Mm -hmm. Our industry somehow, you know, flip this switch from you know, quality versus quantity to, you know, it's about more and more and more and more. So most of my career, you know, and I fully take blame for this is, you know, been around, you know, looking at the total pipeline, but with this almost unrelenting belief that more is better. Yeah. And so, you know, if we just get more incrementally, we'll raise more money and then incrementally, a few of those people will stay with us. And, you know, the math works out just barely in our favor. And what the reaction of that has been is that we've almost trivialized 
which I can't say the word correctly. I won't try again. Um, we've we've transactionized the giving in a way that I think a lot of those people on the receiving end have just gotten more and more and more solicitations over and over that aren't really heartfelt. They're not the the personal, you know, relationship. They're mm -hmm. just you know, donors feel like they're an ATM for the most part. A lot of yeah. people just feel like giving has become so transactional. So I think that is in part the swing of technology um, that we didn't know would be the effect. And now we're starting to see it, just like social media. When mm -hmm. social media came in, we thought it was going to be the great connector. It was going to be something that brought our world together in ways that was never before possible. And now we're seeing a complete dark side to social media in the sense of, you know, anxiety and depression, all time high, happiness, all time low. And so I think it's very similarly, like we've we've made giving more transactional over the years. And I think there's an opportunity and, and the reaction of that has been just people have essentially um, to the first part of your question, they've distanced themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they you know, they either give or don't give, but they're not as personally vested in a mission that they used to be. Mm hmm. Something I've been reading recently, so the giving has declined and we've been seeing a lot of metrics around that, uh, but volunteering is also on decline. Um, right. I think the stat I saw was 23% um, volunteer and, you know, they, they do line share, they do quite a bit and this doesn't take in consideration if you shovel your neighbor's driveway or something like that. I guess right. you don't have snow in California. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, you know, so volunteering is down as well and civic engagement uh, this was from Pew. 90 plus percent of people um, say that voting is important and then about half of them show up. Right. So there seems to be this overarching decline in level of engagement. We don't see it as something we do. It sort of seems like a special extra thing. Um, why yeah. do you think that is? Well, you know, there's a really famous book on this uh, called Bowling Alone from mm -hmm. uh, Putnam, who is a Harvard professor who um, it actually very well documented uh, research book is still not without its flaws, but really the overall kind of hypothesis was, you know, from the end of World War II, when civic participation was at all time high, mm -hmm. that World War II, there was just this like this insane or just in, in very, very strong commitment to like helping others mm -hmm. and be all in it together. And, and something happened after that, which really had nothing to do with the war, but essentially is this, the television made its way into the mm -hmm. living room. And the difference was instead of going home after a hard day's work and sitting on your porch with your neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, talking about your community, you went inside, you watched some TV to unwind. And, you know, his that book is actually quite old now when actually email was just starting. I forget, they don't mm -hmm. even call it email in the book. They call it like electronic something, something, you know, Fast forward to now, you know, the average person gets 333 emails a day and sees between five to 7,000 ad images a day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no doubt that individuals are inundated with mm -hmm. communication. And just, you know, with that, you almost have to almost desensitize yourself to all of it. Like you mm -hmm. have to, your, our ability to connect with people and to absorb things is not infinite. We have a very finite ability to have strong relationships with certain people that you really align with. And so I think we're going through this phase right now in society where people have to become aware of that. Mm -hmm. They have to start making conscious decisions to say, look, the world, everyone in the world, every company in the world wants my attention. Every nonprofit wants my attention. I have to be aware of that first to then decide who am I going to invest more of my attention and my time and my energy and my passion with. And I would say that's extremely finite, like 10, you know, you can't have you know, up 200 best friends, you can have a few best friends, or you can't support every organization, you can su support three or five or 10 that you really care about that are aligned with your values. And I think that awareness and that awakening of this is where we're at in society is, um, is so important, like mm -hmm. conversations like this, like, otherwise, you just kind of go through life, just kind of almost like a zombie just getting hit from every angle, not really knowing where you're going. Yeah, this is, you know, as I'm listening to uh, speaking, it's sort of personally very relevant in how to distill down what's most meaningful and what to focus on, and what to spend time and attention on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think awareness is key. 
And, you know, we've, we've shown um, my co-author and I, when we do some public speaking, we talk about literally the attention span of a human, you know, mm -hmm. is now actually less than a goldfish. So our attention span in the last 20 years is reduced by four seconds. So our attention span as humans is four is eight seconds. A goldfish is nine. You know, most people don't believe that. And then nine seconds later, they're thinking about something else. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there, again, it's it's a, it's the state of where we're at, but it doesn't mean it has to stay that way. I right. think if we if we make conscious decisions to go deeper, to help a neighbor, you know, to your point, yeah, there's this atomization of society. It's just like people are just kind of, I, I don't think they're less generous as, as an individual. I think they're just overwhelmed with, the stimulus that's everywhere around. So it's like, once you think about that and like, Oh, what would that look like if I paid for those, that, that person in front of me and, or behind me in line, or what would it, mm -hmm. you know, what would it look like if I returned that shopping cart for that, that mother who is, you know, trying to balance two young children, you know, yeah. it's this very small type of mindset, you know, shifts that we each can make that actually lead to other greater ways of generosity. Yeah. So let me ask you about the book and kind of the idea behind it and how, you know, how you started uh, down this path. Um, you know, obviously the declines have bub have been bubbling up for some time. Um, it's not brand new. Uh, so what was sort of your tip off where you decided to start exploring this area? Yeah, I, you know, back in 2012, I did a study on the evolution of mega gifts. And so it, it was came on the heels of the giving pledge. So Bill Gates and Warren Buffett created the giving pledge, which was actually an idea basically stolen from Carnegie and Rockefeller. So like, which Warren Buffett actually admitted in interviews, he's like, Hey, I, I took this idea from the past and, and kind of recreated it. And I think, you know, it, most of my education is in more international economics and macroeconomics. So I thought, you know, it was more of this inquiry of like, Hey, is this going to help? Like, I, hopefully optimistically, I was like, this is going to boost generosity. Like there's no tomorrow. Like this is going to be like, you know, philanthropy will be in vogue because Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, everyone's going to be talking about it. Other people want to follow suit, but it took me about 12 seconds to realize it might also have the opposite effect, which was if they're kind of filling the bucket. And at that time I was really passionate about eradication of polio and had gone to India for six weeks and, and in Gates and the Rotary Foundation, Rotary International were really big mm -hmm. proponents of that. And we started seeing people saying, well, if Bill Gates is on the scene, then my gifts aren't that needed. And mm -hmm. we were, you know, I was an ambassador to go back and be like, yes, your gifts are needed. This is like everyone's thing. Like mm -hmm. the world won't be safe for polio until we, we all work together. And so, you know, I think it's, um, you know, fast forward, what we've seen is it's been, um, kind of confusing for a lot of people because we've seen every year philanthropy as a whole go up except for this mm -hmm. in 2022 but every year as a whole like the bucket is getting bigger but there's a separate report that the giving institute produces which tracks individuals who make gifts and so what i started following in 2012 was every year that other report which was showing there was a decline in the number of people giving mm -hmm. so really what we're led, left with now is you know philanthropy is almost a half a trillion dollars. So it's hard to argue like that's not an impressive thing, but what's making up that half a trillion dollars is actually far fewer people. Mm -hmm. you know? So this year alone, 2022, you know, our calculations when we look through the report there are 205 million fewer gifts made. Mm -hmm. So 5% of all individual giving this year came from six people. Right. So, so this is just the big shift that I think for for 20 years, our industry hasn't wrestled with and now is wrestling with. It's like, yeah. okay, we can't ignore this, you know, th these numbers are fairly staggering. So it's almost like the second Gilded Age where, you know, the, the elite, the select few are contributing, but it's masking the problem of declining engagement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's a, a book called Philanthropy. It's like the largest study ever on the history of philanthropy. And, um, and the author calls it philanthropic capitalism. And so what you get with the, the second Gilded Age is also a lot of um, people using philanthropy to control their agenda. Mm -hmm. Like Mackenzie Scott is very rare in the, in the world of just saying kind of like this trust-based philanthropy. It's like give money and like trust, give it to good organizations and let them go do their thing. Mm -hmm. But that's that's like that's the anomaly at this point. Like it's really more about 
you know, a lot more gifts coming that are being used to control, you know, different agendas. And what you end up with is a very, very few organizations, like even with Mackenzie Scott, only one tenth of 1% of any nonprofit will receive a gift from Mackenzie Scott or has received a gift from, right. you know, Mackenzie Scott. So it's not a strategy you can really rely on. Um, but to your point, like we, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say that, you know, that's, half a trillion dollars of generosity is bad. Like uh, no one wants to, you know, right. share that message, but at the same time being extremely aware of, you know, the implications of that type of generosity and how it shapes society. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, you know, the number that really struck me also is we're talking about generosity and declines and individuals. Uh, when you look at the overarching, um, charitable giving pie, um, corporate donations, and, you know, I'll allow there's probably some, uh, dollars that are not reflected in that, but they come for about 6%. Yeah. Which, is, which it, it is. And, you know, that just jumps out on the page because if you look at from 1982 to now, the rise in foundation giving has increased 18%. So there's just been this like, again, it represents high net worth people that are giving yeah. and creating foundations. But when I started in philanthropy in 2000, giving, corporate giving was 6%. Mm -hmm. So there's been no noticeable increase, although what's been really interesting, if you follow um, the rise of, of trust and the measurement of trust, corporations have increased their ability and now actually are more trusted entities than nonprofits. So they've moved the needle extensively in terms of building out kind of from an ethical perspective and a competency perspective, corporations have taken the stand that, you know, they're they're contributing, they're, they're helping benefit to society. Um, while at the same time, you know, you know, none, there's really no tangible increase. Now to your point, there's, a, I think philanthropy is an afterthought for most corporations. I do think there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of goodwill that is actually done through corporations that they don't count because they just don't really think about it that way. So, yeah. so it is hard to measure. It is hard to measure. Well, and I think there's definitely, uh, you know, very vocal about charitable giving, like when Facebook makes a contribution, which really is equivalent to what they make in right. less than 15 minutes, probably, right. or whatever yeah, that number exactly. is. Yeah. But it's very vocal about their generosity. So and it's right. Like Disproportionately, I, mm -hmm. I would argue. You know, I think corporations have learned, um, you know, they've learned to, uh, of, they've learned the nonprofit playbook, which mm -hmm. is essentially forever, it's always been, it's not about, you know, just the end you know, the individual transaction, but it's about the lifetime value of a donor. So like, if you think about like a Nike or, or any big corporation that used to just try to sell shoes to everyone on the planet, they no longer do that. They essentially find individuals that are going to be their brand ambassadors that are going to go the distance that are going to have 20 to 40 X lifetime value for Nike. And and this is something that nonprofits always had done historically. So when we talked about like building those authentic relationships of people that would stay with you for a long time, that's, you know, essentially what the for-profit world has done. And they, they've gotten very, very good at really tapping into that, the ethos of like what makes it not a, a more consumer, but a better consumer. Mm -hmm. And that's now back full circle where nonprofits are faced with this, okay, it's not about more, it's about better. It's like literally everything is cyclical. It's just like coming back full circle. Yeah, yeah. Now you mentioned uh, when we first started this conversation and past uh, talks, you and I have had uh, your work in the artificial intelligence space and some of the emerging things. So I was hoping you can start elaborating on how AI is changing the work of nonprofits, uh, sort of the positives, the exciting things that you're seeing, and also some of the considerations around ethics. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all completely interwoven, you know? So when I, you know, was leading fundraising teams uh, every year, I was faced with this idea of the generosity crisis. I didn't know it wasn't called that. I, mm -hmm. it was just this idea that every year I was asked to raise more money from less people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, really every year, and this is a common theme for pretty much most organizations you're asked to raise every year, your goal goes up. And every year, if you look at the number of people you raise it from, it was shrinking. So back in 2017, you know, just it was kind of like enough's enough kind of thing. Like I was looking at the facts, the goals were getting bigger, the the pool of donors was shrinking. And, you know, it didn't take much to look around at, you know, the most profitable companies in the world, the companies that had replaced all the 
the big industry and the oil uh, industry, you know, they're all, you know, eight of the 10 largest companies in the world are tech or AI companies. Mm -hmm. So I went on this like absolute, you know, mission or pilgrimage or whatever to learn everything I could about AI. I'd always been a technologist, but never a data scientist. So I surrounded myself with really smart people, statisticians, PhDs and computer science. And I just became like the most annoying person on the planet. And I asked like, you know, every stupid question you can imagine for like a year and a half, we ended up building our first algorithm, machine learning algorithm that predicted basically what it did is it measured a person's connection to our organization. Mm -hmm. So rather than just say like, I want to find out the person that's going to make a gift, we kind of took a, a backward approach to say, it really didn't matter how much someone was going to give or when they were going to give or what way it mattered, you know, whether they they cared about us in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from 2017 to now, that's all I've done. I've been working in, in the space where essentially what we consider like quantifying connection. Like we just, we, we can tell if a person cares about our organization and whether or not they're caring for the organization is increasing or decreasing over time mm -hmm. based on, are they opening up emails or are they engaging in other ways or are they volunteering and, and all those things and being able to do that in real time is, is very freeing, you know? So, you know, from an AI perspective, like this is literally a, a you know, a play out of the for-profit playbook. So this is how the biggest companies in the world have become the biggest company in the world because they actually understand what makes a, a better con customer. Yeah. And so, you know, I think while there's the generosity crisis in the sense of less people giving, I'm still, I'm optimistic that AI is probably the only scalable solution to reversing that crisis. Mm -hmm meaning that nonprofits can tap into technology that now is affordable, extremely robust, um, and are able to essentially reverse or kind of flip that pyramid to say, it's not about more people, it's about better people. We can measure those people individually on an ongoing basis. So I, I remain actually, you know, even though I wrote a book called, that's kind of a downer, you know, when it, you know, and, and I always have to tell people, once you get past the first 100 pages, which the first 100 pages is basically like kind of shock of like, this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. But past that, it's a book of hope, which is, look, it doesn't have to remain this way. Now, AI is really built on this idea of personalization and precision. Mm -hmm. Those two things are what nonprofits need to really be able to connect with people at scale. You know, and I guess I should say at the very, and not insignificantly, it's all about this idea of responsible AI. And you alluded to, you know, this idea of like this done well, AI can actually increase trust and it could help inspire more generosity done poorly. We are going to make giving way more transactional than it is now. And the generosity crisis will be on steroids. So this is truly an inflection point for our industry. Well, I would love to kind of continue this conversation and uh, hopefully I'll have an opportunity in a couple of weeks time in person. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Nathan, to wrap up, we do a little game called Two Truth and a Lie. Have you played that before? I have. I have. I think I'm horrible at this game, so we'll see. Okay. We're keeping it like PG-13 maybe. Sure. Um, no more than that, um, just to give you a heads up. So the idea is you're going to tell me three things and... Yeah. Two of them will be truthful, and one is going to be a fib, and it's my job to try and guess which one it is. And what I love about it is finding out uh, things that I would not think to ask you, so just really getting to know you as a human. All right. I'm ready. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. I had to, I had to prepare for this in advance because I'm just horrible at coming up these. Okay, so the first one is I was in New York last week, and I had lunch with Simon Sinek, okay. the author of... Uh, start with why and many other really incredible books. Uh, number two is I'm flying to Hong Kong in September for a one hour presentation. And number three is I'm a sucker for a good rom-com. You know, okay. So you do run in writing circles. So I feel like New York and lunch is probably pretty factual. Um, I'm going to say that rom-com is actually true. And Hong Kong is a lie because it's cutting it way too close to go for one hour. Like the odds of airline actually landing on time for you to arrive and leave back. I just don't see that happening. I think that's the fib. 
So actually, I am flying to Hong Kong for a one-hour meeting on AI um, that I'm presenting on a panel. I I will I'm going to actually stay there for a few days, but okay. I am flying there for one hour. I did not have lunch with Simon Sinek, which I would be like that's my dream status if okay. I if I could. That would be anyone who listens to this and knows Simon Sinek and can arrange that. I I will you know you'll be my hero. Uh, and I am to your point. I am a sucker for a good rom com. So you know. What's your favorite? I knew you were going to ask that. I, you know, <laughs> I, it's hard to say. Probably, if I had to pick one, I'd say the proposal. Like, if I'm, like, if I'm homesick one day, it's either I'm going to watch the proposal or Sweet Home Alabama. Like, I both okay. of them are. But I, yeah, a lot of the classic ones too, like French Kiss, and mm-hmm. I'll even go back to like Princess Bride. So I don't yes. know why, like, but those are my comfort zone. It's probably the part where they're like the games of cups. You yes. Know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing that's what brings you back to Princess Bride. So yeah. Nathan, it's been so wonderful to have you on. I just really appreciate your time. I really appreciate all the insights. Uh, you've definitely given me a lot to think about. Uh, and so I'm just really grateful to talk to you. Yeah, likewise, Olga. It's been great to spend time with you. And I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks in person. Look forward to it. Thank you, Nathan. Bye.